If you were a Nissan fan in the 1990s, you were all about the GTR. If you were a Honda fan, it was the NSX. And for Mazda folk, the RX-7. But if you were Team Toyota, there was one car you wanted above all others. The twin-turbocharged Mark IV JZA80 Toyota Supra. Well, after 18 years, there's a new one. But is bringing back the Supra name a good idea or not? And more importantly, is the all-new fifth-generation A90 Supra any good? Well, we're at a slightly damp racetrack, so it's the perfect place to find out. Let's take a look. Melbourne, huh? Rains all the way here, dirties the car, and then stops. What are you gonna do? Finished in this very cool Nürburg matte gray color, which is a two and a half thousand dollar option, mind you. This 2020 Toyota GR Supra GTS is priced here in Australia from $94,900. But you can get a GT version with slightly less fruit for $84,900. Either way, you're looking at around $30,000 to $40,000 less than the price of a new BMW Z4 M40i. Now, if you don't know why that's relevant to this car, I'll tell you a little bit more later on. Initially teased by the Toyota FT1 concept car back in 2014, the new fifth generation A90 Supra, as you can see, is absolutely stunning. It's obviously taking quite a bit of inspiration from previous Supras, but also even the classic 1967 Toyota 2000 GT. And looking at it front on, if we square this up, have a look at that. That looks good, like really good, and easily every bit as menacing as the old Supra. Up front, you've got these automatic LED headlights, which are the top three squares that you can see there and they've got the little red detail on the edges which is really cool and then underneath those three blocks the next three blocks that you can see are actually your high beam you've got this cool led daytime running light strip along there which when you flick on your indicators becomes your indicator fancy you've got a large front central intake there just like the old Supra, with two intakes on either side, also just like the old Supra. You've also got this front lip here, just like the old Supra, except this one morphs into these front canards to give you some additional downforce. And of course, at the front of this very, very, very long nose, proudly sits your Toyota badge, believe it or not, just like the old Supra. Now, there are plenty of cool looking vents and intakes all over the car. However, if you look a bit closer, you'll see that a lot of these are either restricted or entirely blocked off. Although Toyota does say that this is quite intentional, openly suggesting you could remove some of these blanking plates to improve cooling and aerodynamics if you so wish. Sure. Speaking of aerodynamics, if we have a look underneath the Supra, you'll see that it also has a very flat floor. We also get these reasonably aggressive plastic side skirts along the edge here, again with a bit of a kick up towards the end. The old Supra's rear brake duct has morphed into this door vent, but as we can see, that's blocked off. That's not doing any brake cooling in the door, so it's more there in spirit, really. What is cool though, Nerding out a little bit is that the door handle on the A90 is still quite similar to the old JZA80. It protrudes from the body, you can get your hand around it, and it also lives in this little oval housing. Moving back a little bit, we can see these gloss and matte black electric and heated wing mirrors here with their integrated indicator just there. And I do really like this fairly subtle gloss black a pillar here as well. Pretty cool too, in terms of weight saving, the new Supra's bonnet, doors, and wheel arches are all aluminium items. And speaking of wheel arches, if we just swing around to the profile, you can see <laughs> they are well and truly filled by these awesome gloss black and chrome 10 spoke 19 inch forged alloy wheels, which are actually wrapped in a super specific compound of Michelin Pilot Super Sport tires, measuring 25535s up front and 27535s out back. 
If we have a look inside the wheels, we'll get nice and close in there. You can see we've got red painted Brembo brakes all round with four piston calipers clamping 348 millimeter ventilated discs up front and single piston calipers clamping 345 millimeter ventilated discs out back. Now somewhat oddly, I'm a little bit annoyed by this, the old JZA 80 Supra, the calipers said Supra on them. These ones say nothing, no Supra logo, no Brembo logo. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame. As we move towards the rear of the car, and I've got to say, I absolutely love this fuel filler flap. Um, not only because it's massive, but also because it remains on the right hand side of the car, just like the Mark IV Supra. And have a look at this angle. Doesn't that look just wicked? That's so cool. I think the three quarter on this car is awesome. And a lot of that comes down to these rear guards. How fat and wide and muscular does this thing look? As someone paraphrasing Shakira once said, them hips most definitely do not lie. I also really like this integrated ducktail type rear spoiler and that actually sits on this hatch which again in the name of weight is actually made of a fiberglass polypropylene composite. At the back you've also got these uniquely styled LED tail lights which again I think look quite good. You've got more not quite vents tucked in on the side. You do get this super aggressive rear diffuser, which is also home to this cool F1 inspired rear fog light, which lights up not only with these guys in red, but when you grab reverse, the outside bit smiles at you as well. Now, interestingly, the fifth generation super is actually the first to come with a dual exhaust like this. And I have to say, measuring 100 mils in diameter, they don't only look good, but as you heard before, they sound pretty damn good too. And I particularly like that if you have a close look inside, you can't see, like on a lot of modern cars, any really obvious baffle or valve or butterfly valve, which is really cool. Nice work, Toyota or BMW or whoever. Before we move on, we need to talk a little bit about this guy, the GR badge. So the whole GR tag that Toyota is now using for its performance models, the Supra of which is the first, comes from Gazoo Racing. That's what it stands for, which started life as a Toyota racing offshoot, but has now effectively become a performance sub-brand for the manufacturer, with more GR models to come in future, including the hugely exciting GR Yaris Hot Hatch. Make sense? Oh, and last thing, Supra badge, very, very cool. Toyota badge, very, very not cool. Uh, I don't think we need that. Did we need that? I don't think we needed that. Actually, if you own a Supra or you buy a new Supra, if you could just uh, pop that guy right off, that'd be awesome. Cheers. If we have a look inside, and actually first, how cool are frameless doors? So 90s, so rad. Good to see that those are back. And before we get carried away as well, I really want to show you these before I forget, these Toyota Supra stainless sill plates with the original font and graphics. That looks really, really cool. I like that, that's a nice, nice touch. Yeah, Supra. <laughs> okay, so what have we got here? Well, as you can see, the Mark IV Supra's classic jet fighter plane cockpit style cabin has uh, well and truly gone. And instead we have a fairly clean, simple, and dare I say, Germanic interior. You've got heated leather accented eight-way power adjustable sports seats. The Alcantara finish here with these red perforated spot things. That'll cost you another two and a half thousand dollars if you're interested. You've got white and red stitching on the seats there. And in the floor well, you've also got these sports pedals here. Now, disappointingly, again, as a bit of a fan of stuff, check out the floor mat. What do you reckon? I think that's way too plain. It's just a plain black floor mat. No stitching, no super branding, not particularly exciting. If we jump in and have a look around, it's kind of difficult to ignore that potentially some of this interior may relate to BMW. You've got this thinner at the top, chunkier on the sides, 373 millimeter leather steering wheel, again, with some stitching that you can see along here, but the rest of it's uh, pretty plain. 
You've also got your shift paddles on either side. Looking around and it's clear there's lots of BMW switch gear on the steering wheel, on the doors, the power window switches, lock and unlock. Uh, even this light panel, that's uh, all BMW. The stereo controls probably look familiar if you've ever sat in a BMW. There's quite a bit uh, of it around. This dash tops all fairly soft and rubbery, again, with a little bit of stitching detail, but my most favorite thing, mm, is this reasonably drool-worthy carbon fiber look trim here. I think we need more of that. That looks really cool. It's all nice, gloss, feels nice, looks cool. More of that, please. Now, interestingly, this gloss black, and there's a bit of gloss black along here, and actually a bit of gloss black here, and there's a tiny bit of sparkly flake in that gloss black. And interesting, it kind of looks like what we recently saw in the Toyota Hilux Rugged X. Interesting. In terms of gear, there's keyless entry with a push button start, dual zone climate control, a 12 speaker 425 watt premium JBL audio system, and an 8.8 .8 inch central touchscreen with satellite navigation, Bluetooth phone connectivity, and Apple CarPlay. There's also a head up display and an 8.8 .8 inch multi-information instrument cluster with a digital speedometer and an analog central tachometer, just like the old Supra. Additional tech is abundant with active cruise control and rain sensing wipers, joined by blind spot monitoring, a lane departure warning and autonomous emergency braking. There's also an auto dimming rear view mirror, a rear view camera with rear cross traffic alert and a tire pressure monitor. Storage was never a strong suit of the previous Mark IV Supra and it sure isn't of this new A90 Supra. If we have a look down here, these are your door pockets. They're an absolute joke. Uh, you've got two cup holders here, which again, seems initially handy, but that comes at the sacrifice you don't actually have a center console bin, which was a little bit odd. You do have this little tub at the back, which is um, softly padded with some sponge, but kind of weird. And then down here, you've actually got one single USB input and one single 12 volt outlet. And this little shelf here is your wireless charging pad. But I just can't help but feel like maybe someone at Toyota forgot the cover. Feels like you should be able to close that off instead of having it all, you know, open. There's also not even a sunglasses holder, so that's good. Um, you do, though, get the privilege in the Supra of not only one, but two vanity mirrors. One for the passenger, one for the driver. So vanity mirrors is cool, but what's a little bit weird, both for the driver and passenger, they're fixed. You can't actually pop them out to get the sun. Probably because the height of them is so small that it might not do much on this roofline, but still seems a little bit weird. Now, it wouldn't be a day video without, oh yeah, my favorite, the glove box. So let's have a look. Now, Toyota tells you that you get an additional seven liters of storage capacity in your glove box. And if we open it up, you get not one, not two, but three books about your Supra from Toyota. You have your warranty and service book. You have your navigation manual and you have your normal owner's manual. But again, that's it. Not very special. No leather bound folder or nicely presented anything. Um, that's kind of it. That seems like a bit like the floor mats. It feels like we could have made a bigger thing there. I think that would have been nicer. Oh, and before I forget, just down here for the front seat passenger, you can see they have a handy little netted storage pocket thing just next to their leg there. Very, very helpful, I'm sure. If we hop back out, then I can move the seat forward a little and I get to show you, wait for it, wait for it. We get to check out the back seats. Hang on a second, what? They're missing, where are the Supra's back seats? 
Yes, although every other Supra has had rear seats, alas, in the A90, they are gone. Instead, we have these top tether points for a child seat, one here, one behind the passenger seat, and you also get these very helpful mat pockets for additional storage. You do get some speakers though, so that's cool. Onto the boot then, and if we push this button here, aha. Another little strange oddity that we have with the new Supra is, if you have a look underneath, you'll see a rear camera, and that's about it, because it doesn't actually have an exterior boot release, which means the only way to actually open the boot of your new Toyota Supra is either from the key fob or the button we just pushed. Anyway, lift up the boot. Wow, look at all that space. Uh, so you actually have a 290 litre boot in the Supra and although the entry cavity isn't huge, believe it or not, the capacity is actually 33% larger than you'll find in a new Toyota Corolla. If we have a look in more detail as well, you do get four tie down points in the boot here. You get a 12 volt outlet just here. This thing, there's a puncture repair kit that lives just in there. And on this side, you get a little netted cargo area thing. I do quite like the little LEDs though. You get little LED boot lights, one on each side. Now, if you're as curious as I am and you wanted to know what's under the boot floor of a Supra, if we wriggle the boot and we slide that forward a little bit, under the boot floor you get well, your battery, that's where that lives. So don't go looking to put stuff underneath there. There ain't no room. Pop the hood. 2JZ engine, no shit. Yeah, not quite. As massively famous as the previous Supra's twin turbocharged three liter inline six cylinder 2JZ GTE engine now is, this new Supra doesn't use one. Instead, we have this the single turbo 3 litre B58B30M1 straight six engine. I know, slightly less catchy, but you don't have to put about 15 grand in it or overnight parts from Japan because the thing spits out a more than healthy 250 kilowatts of power or 335 horsepower between 5,000 and 6,000 RPM and a solid 500 Newton meters of torque between 1,600 and 4,500 RPM. Sending all that power to the rear wheels via a ZF8HP51 8-speed torque converter automatic transmission only. Yep, no manual gearbox offered on the new Supra as yet. Toyota claims the 1495 kilogram Supra can hit 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in 4.3 seconds before topping out at an electronically limited 250 kilometers an hour. You may have gathered that it's a little bit wet out today. Uh, and I can tell you, <laughs> this thing <laughs> is a lot of fun. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, this car is the result of a partnership agreement between Toyota and BMW entered into back in 2012. And what that means basically is that the A90 Supra is effectively a hard top twin to the soft top BMW Z4 M40i. Only Japanese and a little bit cheaper. What that also means is that the mighty Supra is now made in Austria, JDM Asbro. Interestingly too, while the new Supra is longer and wider than a Toyota 8.6, it actually rides on a 100 millimeter shorter wheelbase and its rear track 
which measures 15 89 millimeters for those playing at home is actually wider 33 millimeters wider than the rear track of a porsche 911 gt2 rs also kind of cool in a bid to reduce the supra's center of gravity toyota also reduced its ride height down from 130 millimeters to 119 millimeters, which means that this new fifth generation Supra technically sits 11 millimeters lower to the ground than the previous Mark IV. Now, it might be 18 years since the last JZA80 Supra rolled off the production line in Japan in 2002. But the Supra name has been around for way longer than that. It actually goes back to 1978 when Toyota first debuted the name on the first six cylinder Toyota Celica. But with that much history behind it, is this new BMW infused Supra worthy of the name? <laughs> you bet. <laughs> First of all, you've got this engine and it is just an absolute torque monster. It's a beast, this thing. On the street, it gives you good usable torque and power. Out here on the track, especially a damp track, anywhere pretty much in the rev range that you breathe on that throttle. And there's pulling power there and it actually puts a lot of it to the ground, even on a wet track like this. It's punchy and it's responsive. And there's a lot to like about this engine. It might not sound like a 2JZ, but it definitely goes. In fact, the sound is probably one of the only things I really don't like. It just, sounds like I'm driving a video game and I'm pretty sure <laughs> that it sounds a lot better from the outside than the inside. This gearbox too is a little bit of a mixed bag. It's not a dual clutch, it's a torque converter automatic and that's not a bad thing, it's very smooth around town and the paddle shifts are pretty good. Is it the best paddle shifted gearbox I've ever experienced? Not really, but it does a decent job. It's more than adequate and up to the job and it fits this engine really well. But to be honest, I've been around this track in a manual Toyota 8.6 and I really, really miss changing gears, miss driving the car myself, miss blipping the throttle on a heel toe shift myself. I just wish that there was actually a manual transmission option because I think that would make this car just that much more engaging. But it is pretty fun. <laughs> a real highlight for me though are these brakes, these big Brembo brakes. They actually not just have great stopping power when you need to get onto the anchors, but they've got really nice feel. You can really adjust and modulate just how much braking you want or need, and they inspire loads of confidence. The electrically assisted rack and pinion power steering too is pretty good. On the racetrack in sport mode, it is very responsive. The steering's only 2.1 turns lock to lock, so it's very sharp steering, and combined with a 10.4 meter turning circle, which is pretty impressive, it helps the Supra have this real sense of agility. It likes changing directions. It still feels like a biggish car, especially around a tight, damp track like we have today, but the front end always turns in nicely, and even in the wet, these Michelins really add to that, giving plenty of grip, unless you're a little bit too excited. The thing I don't love about this steering system though, and it's something that feels definitely more BMW than Toyota, is it is lacking a bit in terms of feedback and feel. The car does everything you ask it to do, 
but it just doesn't tell you much about what's actually going on. And I miss that a little. Fortunately, the Supra's ride and handling is just sublime. Teaming McPherson struts up front with a multi-link rear and that electronically controlled active rear differential. The Supra feels good on the road. <laughs> it feels even better out on the racetrack. So what do I love most about the new A90 Toyota Supra. <laughs> um, it's back, that's what I love about it. The Supra is back. It's such a historic nameplate and such an iconic Japanese sports car. I'm just glad it's back. It's true, the new Supra is not the old Supra. One turbo has replaced two, a GR badge has replaced an RZ badge and two seats, for some reason, have replaced four. Yes, there's more than a little BMW-ness going on in here. It might look, feel, and unfortunately sound. Like a BMW. But the reality is without that partnership agreement between Toyota and BMW, this new Supra wouldn't exist and that'd be a shame. So I guess it's like any other marriage, really. You gotta take the good with the bad, for better or worse, as they say. And on the plus side, <laughs> this thing is a cracking car. <laughs> We've got fuel in the tank, there's still plenty of tires left and we still have an empty racetrack all to ourselves. What an awesome day, uh, just blown away. This has been really, really cool. If you have any questions at all, please leave them in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them. And remember to like, subscribe and follow. See you next time.